I'm Marian Sasaki. You're watching Life in the Law. I'm delighted to be with you here today after a crazy, crazy week. And uh, I'm also delighted to have Andrew Sasaki on again because he was actually one of my favorite guests. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in America. What's going on, Andrew? What's going on with the police? What is going on with the police? It seems like there have been a number of incidents recently where the police have, uh, have just opened up on, um, on unarmed people. And it just seems to be happening all the time these days. Well, you know, we both lived through 9-11, right? And so we've seen um, the increased militarization of the police force, them, uh, uh, the police becoming more like a, a standing, little a standing. paramilitary organization. Right, exactly. So there's lots more guns and lots more uh, arms. And I think a m much, uh, you know, m more contentious mentality than, than there was before, before the terrorist bombings. The police are always, like, on guard. And unfortunately, it manifests itself not so much in catching terrorists, but in shooting unarmed uh, black people as they drive along the highway. Or don't, as in the ca case in Tulsa, where the guy had to w pull over, and he, he was pulled over, and they, someone called the police. Yeah, well, it's not just uh, it's not just that. I mean, there's also a real uh, a real increase in in escalation. It seems like in in a lot of situations, you know, the police uh, the police tend to escalate situations rather than de-escalating them, and it leads to some kind of a uh, a confrontation, and you know, and gunshots and somebody wounded or, or injured. So, what do you attribute this to? You know, I think it's a lot of things. I think part of it is uh, the police have become kind of paramilitary in a way, and that's because, uh, and that's in a way because of 9-11. Right. You know, after 9-11... I think it is. Well, it right. is. After 9-11, there was a lot of, um, of there was a lot of uh, funding for uh, anti-terrorism prevention, and, you know, that has to be used in a certain way. And so, uh, coincidentally enough, there's also, um, you know, as we're drawing down in, in Iraq and in the Middle East, there's also a lot of, of used military equipment coming into the market. And, you know, if, uh, if the police can, can buy that, and, if, you know, and they kind of have to almost in some cases, or else they don't, or else that, that budget goes away. You know, they have to use it or lose it. So there's a real incentive to, to get these, uh, these tools that were really meant for the military and not for, um, and not for civilian use at all. Right. Well, you know, this latest incident in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, the Justice Department is now looking into it and, and, and doing an inquiry, which I think uh, it's about time because, I mean, how many of these incidents there have there been this year? At least, what, a half a dozen? I, you know, I don't even know. It, it seems like there, it just happens so often. It's just a real, it's just a real um, shame that it's happening so often. You know, right. we, we've, we're, I think we're kind of starting to become desensitized. Well, to let's it talk about Black Lives Matter because you know I have a real issue with people that say all lives matter because y while it may be true that all lives matter. Black Lives Matter stands for a very specific thing. It stands for uh, a group of people who have been oppressed and abused in a, institutionally and personally. And I really don't get why people just have such a problem with the term Black Lives Matter. I mean, it's, it's just acknowledging our history in a sense. What we're, historically, Black Lives did not matter, actually. But, well, you know, that's part of it. I, I don't think anybody wants to acknowledge that there's a problem because it really, um, I think, it goes very deep. And, and you know, I don't think it's, I, I think it's, um, in a way, it's, it's uh, institutionalized, but also in a way it's not because it's not organized in any fashion, right? But there's um, an attitudinal thing. Definitely uh, a lot of police tend to have the us versus them mentality. You know, and, and if you talk to them, I mean, you'll, you'll hear them talking like it's, like it's a war, like it's right. like every right. day, like it's right. a war. Right. right, Life on the streets is a war. Life on the streets. Right. And so, you know, you... But you well, why do you think people feel so compelled to make this argument, like, you know, all, I'm thinking especially, of course, of Donald Trump supporters, but all lives matter. Why does it bother people to, to acknowledge this historical uh, reality that uh, 
uh, people, African Americans face, and we as white people face as well. You know, we like to ignore things, uh, you know, and and not and not. Uh, acknowledge just how bad we've been i mean people try to escape that you know and but i mean who's going to be admitting that well i think we should you know so admitting that means admitting that means changing the way you do business it means um, you know and in a way it's going to mean giving up um, some measure of authority well you know um i it's funny i've read an analysis of uh trump's uh campaign of it's like a socio-political analysis and the person who wrote the article said that th Trump's campaign is the last gasp of white America trying to retain hold re hold on on government and the you know institutional systems and by the next election or the election after that there, there'll be a, a plurality of people of color and it just won't you know or is it majority? Is it a plurality or majority? There'll be pl pl plurality of Latinos and a majority of people of color. And this, and this is a manifestation of white anxiety of giving up a privileged position. It, it, you know, they don't want to give up their, their privileged position. Well, our yeah. I should say our. I, I have a tendency to say there, but I, <laughs> I'm white and I have to, I, you know, identify so, that way. You you are white. Yes. I'm sorry. But I have a tendency to say, <laughs> you know, there. But but no, really, seriously, w uh, the Trump campaign is all about white working class men not wanting to give up the little power they still retain. Um, you know, it, I, I think that's I, I think that's a, a significant part of it. Yeah, but it's also, you know, there's there been there's been like a steady diet of um there's been a steady diet of, of just um the most repugnant and the most repugnant and untrue stuff being fed to people for so long uh through right-wing media that uh, you know, I think a lot of these people don't really know what's really going on anymore. You know, a lot of people get their a lot of people get their news specifically from right wing sources, and and just everything else doesn't count. And and right wing sources will say any kind of crazy thing. Not all of them, but you know, a, a number of the loudest ones. It seems like the loudest ones are always saying craziest stuff. Well, you know, there was an interesting thing on TV yesterday where um, there was that uh, journalist interviewing people, uh, Trump supporters, and asking, "Where do you get your news?" And they and they say on Twitter, oh, on was Facebook. A, was that a journalist or was that the guy on the Daily Show? The, the, the Daily Show, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but doing a better job with that kind of thing than most journalists. Right, do. and and people said, "I don't, ca I'm not, I don't have any articles. I don't care that I'm not informed. I'm just." Voting. I'm just voting the way I'm voting. I, right, I, and he was doing and he was doing crazy things. If if you haven't seen it yet, you should go online and look that up. Um, there's, it's probably on YouTube by now. But uh, I think it was Jordan Klepper going around and asking people. He showed someone two identical pictures of Hillary Clinton and asked, uh, you know, she's using a double. Like, which one do you think is a real Hillary Clinton? And the guy and the person was like very, you know, seriously pointing it out. And oh, I think this one's the double. Well, this ma this mass hysteria. I mean, of uh, I. Paranoia. I mean, it's 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 it. People believe it. They believe it. You know, they believe it in resistance to all to all fact and all. Well, no, you know. I have to say, for, to some extent, the Clintons are responsible for um, the <laughs> the public's uh, taking what they do with a grain of salt. Well, you know, that's but, th that's certainly true. But body double is a little bit. A little bit too body much. Body double is out I there. I don't think Hillary Clinton has a body double. It's, that's, um, that's just a and the whole crazy oh, crazy well, right wing know, trope. Kind of, and speak of crazy right wing tropes. I mean Trump and the birtherism. No, all right. of a sudden it's not a thing anymore, and people should just stop asking Donald right. Trump about it. And you know like, what I love about political spin is that not only did uh, Donald Trump march to this birtherist uh, uh, tune for five years. But now he's saying was it only five years. For, well, that yeah, for, well, the past five years. But now he's saying n Hillary Clinton began it, which is just utter nonsense. But more importantly, that because of his efforts, 
it's it's been answered. The question has been answered, but there was no question to begin with. But it's just it's just shocking. Thank God the the question that Trump has been shouting at the the head of the line through his megaphone is has finally been answered. It was good of him to put that to rest finally. It just it just and I you know it's unbelievable. I mean, what's going on is just and you know Trump is rising in the polls, and. It, well, well, it'll should be very interesting to see what the um, debate is like on next Monday and see. If, you know, I, I don't think it's going to make a difference. You really don't? I don't think it's going to make because a difference. Because the Trump voters are, are, don't care. They, that's not, the, that's how, not how they get form their opinions. I, I, you know, I think there's some number of Trump voters that, that, that will care some. But by and large, I think, uh, I think there are... You know, you, you have to figure a lot of Trump voters aren't really Trump voters. They're anti-Hillary voters. Right. Right? There's nothing Hillary can do to win those people over. And then there's a lot of Trump voters that really are Trump voters. You know, the number of persuadables that are, that are, in, the, um, that are in either camp is probably not very large. I mean, uh, you know, politics have become so polarized. That scares me, though, because how some... Somebody's got to win. Some some undecideds have to be swayed. So, you know, Trump has pushed the, the envelope so far that that you have to wonder what future political campaigns are going to be like. He's I can't imagine now because this has really been a breaking point, right? This has really been a watershed election. It's been a watershed election, but not only that, but Trump has gotten so far. He's he's gotten more than a billion dollars worth of free media coverage just because he keeps saying the most outrageous stuff, and he's constantly in the news. If you turn on any political show, like any day of the week, they'll be talking about Trump. George Bush, George Bush Sr. Isn't is, voting is, is, for Trump. Is He's voting, voting for, for Hillary. Hillary Clinton. Yeah, yeah. I know. It, it, not, I, I think, you know what, the question isn't really so much uh, what the forthcoming elections are going to look like. What's the forthcoming Republican Party going to look like? Is it just going to go back to business as usual and just uh, ha having had this uh, anomaly, this this character who sees the reins of the party and they'll they'll just put it out of their heads like a bad dream and then go back to business but what if he wins does the does the republican congress work with him i can't see it i can't well i mean the republican congress will have to work with him right first of all how, how many republicans have actually come out against him there have been so many that uh, have have come down on his side just out of sheer party loyalty you know, not but it's like lukewarm support. I mean, he doesn't... Sheldon Adelson isn't giving him any money. I read an article where Sheldon Adelson was giving the Republican... Sheldon Adelson is, is a big uh, billionaire uh, developer, and he makes quite a right-wing, makes quite large contributions to Republican candidates. And he uh, is giving $45 million to the party, but only $5 million to Trump. And that's supposed to be... Well, I mean, you know... Things that go to the party, uh, I mean, once, once they're in the hands of the party, who's to say the party has to spend them, you know, who's to say that money can't get spent on Trump anyway? Well, Maybe he's not. I don't think the part. well, I don't know. Is the party, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But look, let's take a quick break and we can think about it. We can think about it. Is the party really supporting Donald Trump? Are they half-heartedly supporting him? Does he have a chance to win? Who knows? You're watching Life in the Law on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m., where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in, and aloha, and thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon, thinktechhawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kawilucas.com, where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Marion Sasaki. You're watching Life in the Law. Uh, and, uh, Did we properly ponder uh, the, the Trump phenomenon? Well, first I want to introduce you and say that you're Andrew Sasaki, my husband, and I'm very grateful that you came down today to be a guest <laughs> on my show because there's a little confusion about guests. And it's I true. find I'm you Mr. riveting, as you know, to talk to. So I hope the audience <laughs> finds you riveting as well. I, I doubt they'll find me as riveting as you do. I know, I do, I do, I do find you riveting, I must say. Yeah, I, I wonder if the, the, there's really full-throated support among the Republican Party for, for Donald Trump. I don't think Ryan, Ryan's previous is really... He seems pretty ambivalent. You know, uh, Rice Priebus is, is a good little soldier, and he does whatever they tell him. So, you know, I, I've heard Rice, Rance, Rice Priebus uh, vigorously defending Trump. Um, and just, it, it is so hard sometimes for the Republicans to spin Trump stuff, um, especially because Trump may very well drop the position he was previously holding the next day. You know, they'll, they'll spin it one way, and then they'll... <laughs> And then they'll have to walk it back the next day. Only, only he's moved on. He's off somewhere else. But you know, I have to say that um, Kellyanne Conway, the the new Trump right. campaign manager, she's done a terrific job with respect to um, grooming him as a more sophisticated political figure. I mean, he's really been on point for the past month since she's come on the campaign, uh, right, you know. He, he has and he hasn't, you know. By, to a large extent, um, he's had surrogates doing his talking for him. You yeah, know, but who and listens to the surrogates? No, you, but who they're, they're the ones Chris that are, Christie? They're the ones that are talking about a lot of stuff, you know, and the surrogates will spread out and they'll, you know, and they'll hit the, uh, and they'll hit the media outlets in like a big wave and and so you know you have all these people that are right on message with whatever uh, with whatever crazy thing Trump said last so you know it's already had like a this debilitating effect on um, on our on the body politic just from moving the Overton window so far what's the Overton window horrible what's the Overton window <laughs> I know you know what the Overton I window don't know is what but the Overton window the Overton is, window is um, is this theory that there's a range of acceptable discourse. And if you, and if you take a very extreme position, then, uh, then that moves the range of acceptable discourse in that direction. And so uh, the, oh, the, positions, the positions that have been taken are so extreme that they've really pushed the boundaries of acceptable behavior farther out than they used to be. Is it applicable to other areas besides politics, the Overton window? Discourse in general? Discourse in general, sure. And how, who, who is Overton, do you know? I don't know who Overton is. I like to know who Overton is. Because it's really true. It's like if there's, you have an outlier and the outlier insists on having his or her point heard and is is repeatedly uh, s says the same thing over and over again. The conversation does follow. They, the squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of thing. And uh, Trump has pushed the political discourse into, in, you know, insane... Oh, he's, he's pushed it off into places where it's never been before. We're not even talking about policy. We don't, I don't even really, uh, you know... No, I mean, there's, I'm not there's even no certain about... Policy, no policy to, to like discuss. social security reform or you know the policy is you know his policy is uh, he's going to buy low and sell high he's going to do the right things and not do the wrong right. things he's going to he's going to he's going to take care of the bad people and and reward the good people like that's that's the policy well listen just think um <laughs> So there's a little bit of equal time, although there usually isn't with me. Let, let me say that uh, there's another there's a Democrat in the news now, Anthony Weiner again, again, for bad behavior. No, yes, for what bad happened? Beha with an underage girl, a high school girl. And I have to say, Anthony Weiner, you're a brilliant politician. You were brilliant in Congress. You could have made a brilliant mayor. But please help, get help. I mean, I can't. It's it's just heartbreaking to watch. The, it's, you know, his biggest strength is as Anthony Weiner, but his worst weakness is as Anthony Weiner. You know, I don't know that it's a character flaw. I think it's, you know, much more deeply embedded than that, frankly. And I, I mean, uh, to have somebody who knows what it's like to be in, in the public spotlight and still can't m control what what he's doing it's 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 disturbing to watch you know it is really disturbing to watch it really is right and yeah so that so that we, the democrats have their crazies too i guess that's my point right the democrats have their crazies 
the, the Democrats do have their crazies. But you know, it's funny. Like I feel like the Democratic crazies hurt themselves, and the well, Republican I crazies mean, hurt other people. You know, but if you have a Democratic crazy, Democratic crazy like Anthony Weiner, you know, or like Elliot Spitzer, they end up they end up uh, owning it, apologizing it, and getting out of office. Whereas if you have a Republican crazy, they will fight until no, they until stay. death. If they ever, ever admit any wrongdoing, no. which they never do, Dennis unless they're Pastor, right. unless yeah, right, I'm, so many others, so many others. So how's the world the with guy IT with the wide now, stance Andrew, in the, since, <laughs> since the last time I spoke to you? How's the, how's the hackathon? Um, well, you know, the time is starting to is starting to draw to a close. Um, I've been plowing through election data, looking at campaign contributions, and trying to to match different groups to different groups to their contributions and um, figure out what uh, industries they belong to. And uh, Any news? No, 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 not particularly. It's kind of surprising how, how many mainland groups have their, have their fingers in the, in the pie. In Hawaii? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How so? Well, you know, there's, there's, groups in, uh, there's groups in Las Vegas. Um, you know, you wouldn't think Hawaii would be a big NRA state, but the NRA has done a lot of contributions. Really? Right. That's fascinating. But no, I, I actually, I... The NRA and Pfizer, well, I mean, it kind of makes sense in a way because, you know, Hawaii has, has like, been at the vanguard of, of pushing back against the NRA. Right. I, so. I, well, I think there's a lot of guns here. I mean, it's funny, I had this conversation with somebody at the office and, and I said that, you know, I was worried about, you know, gun ownership in Hawaii and, the, and they're like, that's, you don't need to worry about that. I'm like, I think I do, actually. You, you're saying there's a lot of guns, but Hawaii probably has fewer guns per capita than, than most places. You know, if you've ever lived somewhere like Texas or Arizona, well, Texas which I have. Well, Texas isn't a good, isn't a, <laughs> your, Texas isn't fair. Every, yeah. When you're born, they give you a little teeny tiny gun. I know, they? they give you like a little starter gun. Yeah. You know, not like a full on gun, but a little starter gun. So I, I told you about, uh, I, I've told you the story about me, a Ann Richards uh, before she was governor. Right. You well, maybe, but maybe you want to tell it again. Oh, right. Well, I, I was working in a 7 Eleven while I was in college at University of Texas at Austin, and Ann Richards was still the state treasurer, and she used to come by every day. And, and you know, we got into a conversation about guns, and I was just telling her how surprised I was. Everybody carries guns, and she's like, oh, well, I carry a gun. It's just a little old lady gun, and she pulls out this, you know, 25 caliber Everybody, chrome yeah, so that's, I like, wouldn't compare Hawaii here's this, to here's this uh, nice, Texas. You know, here's this nice Not woman, fair. she's state treasurer. Yeah, just carry around a gun, just... I imagine New York has more guns, but I don't. I didn't feel that there were more guns in New York. But I imagine there were a lot of guns that I didn't know about. You know, in New York City, it's probably, it's probably not. Dis it's probably not evenly distributed the number of guns. I have to say, like most things. No, I don't think that it is. No. So I, I don't think you, you'd really venture out into places where there's more guns. But I bet, like upstate, there's probably a lot more gun ownership than. Well, I think it's the kind of the of the profile of the pro NRA, you know, a rural kind of lower middle class, you know, white population is that's more the profile of the NRA, I think, right? right. So, so the likelihood is. So, what do you think is Hillary going to take Pennsylvania? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, what do you think about that? I think she'll take Pennsylvania, but I think she's going to lose Florida. I could easily see her losing Florida. And the reason I, th I, the gun thing brought that to mind was because I was, these are two places that have urban areas and rural areas that vote very, very differently. People in Philadelphia don't vote the way the rest of Pennsylvania votes, and people in Miami don't vote the re way the rest of Florida votes. But that's the same way with New York. You know, New York City is is uh, completely different uh, voting-wise than the rest of the state. Yeah, but I can't see New York State going uh, going to Trump, well, even no, though he not can. necessarily Trump, but but you know the the state votes very differently depending on that. I, I I'd like to know when the last time the New York State voted uh, overwhelmingly Republican for maybe George Bush. It's possible. I don't know. It's possible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But these these swing states: Ohio, uh, Florida, Pennsylvania. W w where else? These these are the real battleground states. Oh, uh, Michigan, I think as well. Because so Michigan, Michigan has a Republican states? governor who's running and doing well, and Don, and but Hillary Clinton is winning there. It's just it's a, it's a, like a polyglot. It's you know you. <laughs> It, it really is. Nice use of the word polyglot. 
So, no, 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 but it's nice of you to acknowledge that yourself. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the, this, when it comes down to it, it comes down to really four or five states. You know, it, I, that's what they always say. I don't know if, I don't know if that's um, as accurate as it used to be, but, you know, the states are so heavily, a lot of voting uh, blocks are so heavily gerrymandered that it's, you know, if Trump, to say. If Trump wins Florida... You have to come back on this show. Oh, man. I know, how horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you need me on the show, you're going to get me on regardless, I, right? Like, right? It's not going to matter whether or not. Yeah, I guess won. I know somebody, right? You, you know somebody. You've gotten in. But no, but I want you to come back when there's results from the hackathon and, and, oh, and also more results from the IT community and the burgeoning silicon, I don't want to say valleys, we're not a valley, silicon islandness of Hawaii. Should be a silicon hotspot or silicon silicon hotspot, right? But also, there's a lot of silicone here. So it's when you you know use the oh, silicone gloves and I, take stuff I, out of the I, oven. I mispronounced silicon. Is silicone? Sorry. Okay. So, do you have any parting words for our audience? Oh yeah, everybody out there should watch Atlanta, the new TV series, because it's really good. You know, I knew you were going to bring that up. I knew it. I knew when you were talking about Texas. Yes, in fact, the TV show Atlanta is terrific, and it's. Uh, it's a smart, incisive uh, look at uh, race and, and economics, and, but it's uh, hilariously funny. So what's Donald Glover's? Donald Glover. Donald right. Glover's Atlanta. The guy used to be on Community. If you like politics and, you like, and you're keenly aware of social uh, issues, this is a show for you. This is a keenly observed show. But I mean, it stands on its own even without that. It's just funny and really keenly observed and yeah. really well written. Yes, yes. So, well, thank you for doing the little <laughs> promo. I guess Donald Glover would thank you also. Yeah, Donald, I'll tell you where you can send the check. <laughs> okay. So, once again, Andrew, thank you. Well, I would have to say there is a connection between Andrew Sasaki and the law. He remains the son of a lawyer. So, thank you for coming, son of the lawyer, on to <laughs> Life in the Law today. You really helped me out. I appreciate it, and I love talking to you. I love, uh, you know, I like kibitzing, as we used to say. Kibitz, is, which is Yiddish for chatting. It's good to have a good conversation. It's good to have a good conversation. So join us next week, Wednesdays, 1 to 1.30, Life in the Law. I promise you a more legally legal show next week. Maybe a little less Trumpy. A little less Trumpy. I'm Marian Sasaki.